there's a number of studies, some smaller, um, some more formalized, that are giving us hints as to what ripple effects we might expect from the protest. From the start, people definitely, people being experts, infectious disease experts, epidemiologists, were all saying that, of course, anytime you have a mass gathering that could present a, the perfect opportunity for the virus to hop from an infected person to uninfected people. Um, so any gathering remains very risky and that should be acknowledged at the outset. But the massive protests, particularly ones in large cities like New York, do not appear connected to any spike in transmission of the virus. And there's multiple reasons as to why that could be. Uh, experts do acknowledge that many, at least protesters, were wearing, have been wearing masks, mostly ubiquitously, at least from photos and news coverage. So of course that's helpful. Pro and protests take place generally outside where viral particles have more of a chance to disperse and they don't accumulate as they do in poorly ventilated indoor environments. So both of these factors, of course, are very important. Um, but that doesn't explain everything. New data from a cell phone tracking study, so this doesn't look at individual cell phone movement, so the movement of individuals is how that translates, but rather the movement of cell phones in general across a larger area, so kind of at a population level is what we're looking at. But a new study that's come out hinted that while people were gathering at these large protests, especially in major cities, and those were going on day after day after day, they're still continuing here, for instance, people in the wider population actually stayed home more. So there's millions of people in some of these cities, and a percentage of them are out at the protests, and that represents a potential hotbed of infection. But people actually improved their social distancing overall in the population. So it's thought that while these protests were happening, people staying home more can actually buffer the potential spread of the virus because say multiple individuals at a rally become infected or pass an infection among themselves. If other people aren't out and about as much, there's a lower chance that those infections can hop from the protesters, from police officers, to the wider population. So that would slow viral spread. And that appears to be what's happening, at least in major cities, with persistent protests, which is kind of an interesting dynamic to acknowledge. And it doesn't seem that this difference, this um, increase in social distancing, doesn't appear connected to the institution of curfews. For instance, here in New York, it was initially 11 p.m. and then moved to 8 p.m. So the curfews account for some of the change in social distancing, but mostly it seems that people were just staying home voluntarily in order to kind of avoid whatever conflict might be brewing outside. Um, so just a general increase in social distancing throughout the day, regardless of the curfew. A couple small surveys from Boston, Minneapolis, and Seattle also suggest that a fairly low number of viral transmissions are taking place at the protests in the first place. This is very preliminary data, um, but people who reported having been at protests in Boston, Minneapolis, and Seattle, uh, in Boston, the rate of positive tests coming back was about 2.5%, which is reflective of the overall positive test rate in the city at large. Uh, in Minneapolis, it was about 1.8%, which is uh, lower than the state overall. And then in Seattle, the rate of positive tests was less than 1%, which is um, significantly lower than the overall county that Seattle is in. So King County is up around above 6% positive test rate at the moment. So less than 1% from the protests would present a very low rate of transmission. Of course, this data is limited by who goes in for a test, who presents symptoms, all that sort of thing. But these areas are prioritizing protesters as another potentially at-risk group. So beyond people with pre-existing medical conditions, beyond those exhibiting severe symptoms, that sort of thing. So pre protesters are also being prioritized for testing. Um, so I think that's key in all of this as well, is if you've been to a protest, consider getting tested a few days after you've attended, about four to five days. Um, 
and do that every time you go to a protest and certainly watch yourself for symptoms. So of course, acknowledging other compounding factors, many of the protest crowds skew fairly young and we know generally speaking at a population level, younger individuals are at lower risk of having severe complications and severe symptoms. This is not universally true at the individual level, but at a population level. So it may be that because there's so many young people, some are only contracting mild infections and then you might not catch those in the data. So we're still learning a lot more about what's happening with the protests, but as of yet, all the data points to these surges, for instance, in a lot of Southern and Western states, these are connected to the state's reopening. And that's what the data is pointing to right now in terms of the timing, in terms of when we knew restrictions were being lifted, in terms of tracking the cell phone movement of different people, all that sort of thing, all points to because states were opening that then subsequently led to a surge in infection because of movement in the wider community. So all things to keep in mind as the protests continue. Again, this is early days. Um, things might change as we go forward. We don't know yet, um, but this is what we're seeing so far. Thank <laughs> you.